Well, hey everybody, I'm David Robinson, and I'm really glad you're tuning in today. Steve Ambrose, he wrote a book a few years back about the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early days of the 1800s, and that book was called Undaunted Courage. And he charts in that book how for two years, for 24 months, that expedition faced unbelievable problems. You know, unfamiliar territory, hunger, heat, exhaustion, morale problems, hostile enemies, serious illness, even death. And after two years of this, they reached the Continental Divide out west. And according to the best advanced information they had, their expectation was that once they crossed over the Continental Divide, they'd fa face about a half day's worth of portage when they would carry their boats over land between two bodies of water. And then they'd come to the headwaters of the Columbia River, which would kind of float them gently down to the Pacific Ocean. So that was their expectation. They come to the Continental Divide and Lewis, he, he leaves his team and he climbs up to the bluffs to look at what's on the other side there. Now imagine what goes on in his spirit when he's expecting to find just a gentle sloping valley and then the waters that'll take him to the Pacific where they're hoping to go. Instead of seeing that, he sees the Rocky Mountains. And he realizes before they head for the easy part, they're gonna have to climb the Rocky Mountains. Imagine you're leading that expedition. What do you say to that little team that's waiting for you to come back down and tell them what's next? You know, they're gonna have to strap on all the equipment on their backs and, and climb who knows how long to face who knows what that lies beyond the other side. Now, because of this adventure, because of climbing the Rocky Mountains, they would have to dig down deeper than they knew they could. And, and they'd have to get more creative and they'd have to find reserves of strength and, and will that they didn't know they had. And because they were able to do this, they'd be filled with a confidence that they could face absolutely anything, do absolutely anything. The challenge of crossing the Rocky Mountains would do every bit, bit of that for their spirit. But of course, on this side of the Rocky Mountains, they didn't know any of that. All they knew was that they thought they were almost home free, and then they had the biggest mountain of all still to climb. You know, the truth about all of us is we face the Rocky Mountains at some point in time or another, and in a lot of ways, it's probably felt like this year we've had to face the Rocky Mountains. I mean, health challenges and uncertainties, relational strain, financial pressures, vocational difficulties, racial difficulties, spiritual difficulties, political tensions. I mean, it feels like all of 2020 is facing the Rockies when no one was expecting to. And listen, putting 2020 aside, on the flip side of 2020, there will be more moments for every one of us at some point in time or another where we'll hit, all, hit the Rocky Mountains. What happens then? What happens next? You know, there are these studies that involve people who have been through a very deep trauma, Tough challenges, you know, survivors of World War II prisoner camps, studies of POWs in the Korean War, uh, people who have been in hostage situations, people who had traumatic accidents, really, really deep trauma, you know, people who root for the Orioles, that kind of thing. And many of these people, as you might expect, they just get defeated by the Rocky Mountains. They come to this mountain range and they experience resignation, you know, defeat, withdrawal. Whatever optimism they may have brought with them, it's all gone and their heart just melts. And then there are others who face the same traumatic situations, but they end up not giving up. It's like a fire keeps burning deep inside of them and moves them toward action and uh, exploring creative solutions and, and keeping at it. And they end up enlarging their capacity to, to handle difficult situations. They actually deepen. They find within themselves, as Viktor Frankl, a survivor of the World War II concentration camps, talked about uh, when he talked about an attitude and a spirit that says, no matter what my captors may take away from me, they can't take away that ultimate freedom to choose my own attitude and the posture of my own heart. Well, how do they do that? I mean, when you come to the Rockies, how do you keep going? How do you muster up the energy and persevere? Well, I think the key is hope. Resiliency comes because of hope, which is why it's so important to find our hopes in the right place, which is what I want us to think about today. In the Bible, in the 15th chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about this through a prayer that he prays for the church in Rome. 
And it's a prayer that we ought to pray as well. It's a prayer that we ought to adopt. Romans 15, 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so you'd overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope. Did you catch that? God is a God of hope. Ultimate hope comes from God. That's where it's found. That's what he's saying here. And Paul prays that the Christians in Rome would not just have a little bit of hope or have some sort of positive disposition or something. Paul wants them to overflow with this hope, to have hope just spill out over their lives. I have three kids. Uh, my oldest two, Daniel and Joshua, are in college now. My youngest is my daughter, Elise. She's in high school. And when my kids were younger, I can recall very vividly how much they loved when it was chocolate milk time. There'd be a moment when we marched to the kitchen because we were going to take the fruit of the cow and enrich it with some chocolatey goodness. And they'd want me to fill their glass of milk up as full as the glass could actually get. You know, when you're pouring some milk, just plain old milk for them to drink, they don't want you filling it too high. But if you're putting that Hershey syrup in there and essentially making it a dessert, then they want you to give them as much milk as that glass can hold. So we get it as full as we could, and then we pour that chocolate syrup, and we try to be ever so careful when we stirred it all up. But by the time we were done, there'd be like a convex of chocolate milk protruding above the edge of the cup. And we'd try to be careful not to spill any of it, but it didn't, it didn't matter. I mean, my kids got chocolate milk everywhere. It was on their clothes and all over their face and on their hands. It'd be spilled all over the floor and all over the, the counters. I mean, Chocolate milk just spilled out everywhere. It overflowed. And that's what Paul's saying here with hope. That's the picture he's given us. It needs to spill out all over your life, all over the place. Make sure the hope that comes from the God of hope overflows from the edges of your life. See? But make no mistake, the kind of hope that leads to a persevering spirit, a re resilient spirit, it comes from God. Which leads me to an observation today. From a Christian point of view, hope is rooted in our understanding of who God is and how God wants to interact in our lives. And this is a very different kind of thing than the stuff we're bombarded by in our self-help kind of world. And listen, we're not talking about a detachment from reality here when we're talking about hope. Now, this isn't detachment from reality. You know, that, that was on display, display beautifully in that classic, classic movie, came out in the 90s, 1994 actually, and how it didn't win the Oscar for Best Picture that year, I do not know. But many of you probably have seen that movie. It was called Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, Jeff Daniels and Jim Carrey, they, they play two hapless fellows, Harry and Lloyd. And Lloyd, Jim Carrey's character, has a crush on a woman named Mary, played by Lauren Holly. And he musters up the courage to ask her very directly about their chances of ever getting together, of being a couple. And so he says to her, what are my chances? And she says, not good. <laughs> and Lloyd says, you mean not good like one in a hundred? And she says, I'd say more like one in a million. And then there's a pause. And Jim Carrey's character says just a terrific line. He says, so you're telling me there's a chance. Lloyd had a total detachment from reality. And that's not what we're talking about here. And in the biblical sense, this isn't about, I don't know, hyping myself into believing that everything's going to turn out the way I want it to. And because of that, because it's going to turn out like I want, well, then I'll keep going. I'll persevere. It's not the idea that I can have whatever job will make me feel successful and whatever house I think would be comfortable to me and accumulate as much money as I want to accumulate and get married to somebody who I think is real attractive to me and have as much fun and pleasure and power and status and prestige in life as I want to, as long as I keep just a real positive attitude and I'm able to visualize it and all that kind of stuff. That's not what we're talking about at all. Hope is the confident expectation that an all-powerful God is at work, even in this fallen world, to redeem it and to bring good out of it, you see. And it's not just that. It's not just that I believe that there's a God out there. It's also the confident expectation that this same good, powerful God is intimately aware of, 
of and deeply concerned about my life and my future and the role that he wants me to play in his work in this world. Which means that I can face today with a resilient confidence and unshakable poise, not because the circumstances of my prosperity and health and all that are going to work out the way that, that necessarily looks wonderful from this culture's perspective, but because an all-powerful God, an all-good God is at work to be redeeming this world. And He knows about and is deeply concerned about my life and the role that He wants me to play and what He's up to. Of course, the Bible is full of statements about all of this, hopeful statements. And one of the reasons why it's so important to become a student of the Bible is so that these statements would increasingly govern your mind and your attitude and your spirit. You know, David in the Bible, uh, he's one of the most hopeful, resilient people of all time. And he's constantly saying things like in, in one of his Psalms, he says to God, he says, hey, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With God, I can leap over a wall. Actually, Eugene Peterson, he wrote a terrific book with that, that title, Leap Over a Wall. In other words, David says, there's simply no obstacle that can thwart God's intent for the lives of his people. No obstacle at all. I mean, maybe the ultimate statement along these lines is what Jesus said in the 19th chapter of Matthew when he said, with God, all things are possible. And it's important to remember that those two phrases, they go together. They're linked together. Jesus doesn't simply say all things are possible. Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. With a life that is submitted to God, with a heart that is tender and yielded before God, as a partner in a prayer-filled life with God, All things are possible. So when have you prayed for God to do the impossible in your life? You see, the opposite of all this is that I live at the mercy of my circumstances. You know, without this perspective and without this trust in the God of hope, I'll just live at the mercy of my circumstances. My own sense of worth and esteem is continually up for grabs because of that. And I'll lack a solid inner core of my identity and mission and purpose. I'll lack direction and an inner confidence. In the Bible, the author of the book of James, he calls this lack of confident trust in God double-mindedness. And the metaphor that he uses is that somebody who lacks this confident trust in God is like a wave of deceit that's blown forward one minute and blown backward the next because They're just at the mercy of how the wind is blowing, how life goes from day to day. And James, he he says, they are double-minded and unstable in all they do. There's a marked instability. Henry Nouwen, he put it like this. Check this out. He says, that issue here is the question, to whom do I belong? To God or the world? Many of my daily preoccupations suggest I belong more to the world than to God. A little criticism makes me angry and a little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits. A little success excites me. It takes very little, he writes, to raise me up or thrust me down. Often, I am like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. It depends on how the wind's blowing. And I know what that's, that's like, and that's an unstable way to live because then I'm just at the mercy of the most recent words that come my way and circumstances and feedback from others in this world. It's always a good news, bad news story, you know? I've spoken a few times for some high school baccalaureates in the area, and on one occasion, the church I was working at was hosting the baccalaureate. I was a youth minister at that church. It was actually a mountain Christian church just north of us here, but I was also the associate preaching pastor at the time. I had my hands in both those arenas. And after this baccalaureate, there's this woman who came up to me and she really complimented me. Uh, She said, man, that was awesome. Just awesome. I was really moved by what you said and how you said it. And at that point, I was even thinking uh, on that day, I was thinking, well, I did a pretty good job. But she went on. She said, I've never been to church before. Never had any interest at all. I just came here today because a family member is graduating this year and I'm here to support them. But I think I'm going to come to this church this weekend. And by this time, I'm feeling really good about all this. I'm thinking like Preacher of the Year Award or something like that. But she said, yeah, that was great what just happened. And I'm coming this Sunday because somebody over there told me that the other guy who normally speaks, he is so much better. I mean, you were good today, but they're telling me he's awesome. And it was kind of a, I don't know, backhanded comment kind of thing going on there. 
Now, if I'm dependent on smooth circumstances or positive feedback for the fuel I run on, well, I'm in a pretty vulnerable position there. I mean, think about this for you. What's it take to ruin your day? I mean, if you have a problem at work or school or your teacher or boss doesn't rave about your performance or your financial situation goes a little south or a friend or a spouse snaps at you or you look in the mirror and you just don't like what's, what's going on there, what's it take to ruin your day? You see, the lower your sense of confident trust that an all-powerful God is at work in this world and in your life, the less it takes to ruin your day. And what will happen over time is, well, you just lose life. You lose energy, you lose motivation for life, and it just kind of leaks out of you. And your life becomes kind of an emotional roller coaster. And the wind is blowing in a good direction. You know, when that's happening, that's okay. When it pushes back against you, well, you're in trouble. And you lose this clarity about who you are and what God called you to do. Life becomes a series of nice projects that never get finished and noble promises that never get honored. And you like a clear sense of inner direction and confidence and strength. And you know, the Rockies, they just win. They defeat you. See, without this confident trust in God, you'll have a tendency to develop a pattern of giving up in your life. Without confident hope in God's help, you'll develop a pattern of giving up in the face of whatever obstacles you face. You know, pressure, threat, challenge, opposition. You'll just walk away. Now, there's a fascinating study. Uh, it was done by a psychologist named Schneider, and he did a test with college students, and it consisted of this hypothetical situation. And the hypothetical situation was that you, you set a goal of getting a B in this particular class, whatever that class was, and when your first exam, which is worth 30% of the final grade, is returned, you actually receive a D. Now, it's one week after you learned about that D. What do you do? You know, how do you respond? And Schneider found that the variable, the crucial variable, was hope, just hope. Not brains, not intelligence, just hope. He found that students who measured out high in terms of their level of hope in their life well, their response was, first of all, to try to work harder, and secondly, to think of a range of ways that they could bolster their final grade. They'd think about creative solutions, and then they'd muster up the energy to pursue them with a great deal of vigor. Those were the students who, who scored well on the level of hope. Students who had a moderate level of hope, even though they had the same level of intelligence, they were able to think of some options to help their grade, but they were far less determined to pursue them. And then the third group of students, those that measured out low on the hope scale, they just gave up easily on both accounts. They didn't bother to think up solutions, and they had no energy to pursue them. Schneider found that hope made all the difference. Hope was a better predictor of how students would do in schools than SAT scores or high school grades or IQ tests. And of course, this isn't just true in school. It's true in life. People who don't overflow with hope they don't see themselves as having the energy or the ability or the means to accomplish their goals or solve their problems. And they don't see God as this all-caring, infinitely powerful friend who wants to partner with them in their life. And a horrible thing happens along the way. They just give up. They come up against the Rockies and they give up. They run into a problem, whatever barrier it is. Maybe it's a barrier with a vocational dream that comes their way and they give up. They run into a problem with their parenting life that's tough and they, they withdraw into passivity or inactivity. They run into a financial problem. Maybe they have a character issue that's really hard to change and they just give up. And I don't want you to give up. And moreover, God doesn't want you to give up. So let me ask you, where in your life are you getting a D? Is there some area where the grade you're getting back is not as high as the grade you'd like to get? I'm talking about life here. And maybe it's, maybe it's with a relationship. Maybe it's a marriage deal if you're married. Maybe it's with your family. Maybe it's at work or in your school. Maybe it's in your spiritual life. How are you responding, honestly? Are you really asking God for help? Are you thinking about different ways to attack the problem? Are you mustering all the energy you have because you know it matters and you know it's worth it? 
Or are you honestly just kind of giving up? I want you to be careful. You know, don't get in the pattern that when difficulty or pressure or challenge or threat comes along, you just give up. Of course, this means you'll have to take responsibility for your hope. You got to own this. See, I know when we talk about this, there can be a kind of thought that goes through many people's minds. It's probably going through some of your minds right now. You say, yeah, Dave, it's all well and good for you to talk about hope and resiliency and all that, but you don't know. I mean, you don't know what I've been through or you don't know about the loss I've suffered or you don't know how unfairly I was treated, Dave, or you don't know how bad my upbringing was or You don't know what a difficult person that I'm married to. You don't know the kind of dreams that have never and will never be fulfilled for me. You don't know how much I've suffered, Dave. You just don't know my problems. And you know what? You're right. I don't know. I mean, truly know. Nobody knows the unseen scars and wounds and hurts, you know, the disappointments that mark the heart of anybody else. Nobody knows. But I do know this, and for some of you, if you take nothing away today, be sure to grab onto this. You are responsible for your life, not anyone else, not your mom or your dad, not your brother or your sister, not your neighbor, not your friend, not your spouse if you have one, not your boss, not your teachers, not your coaches. And there's a choice that you have, and it's in your hands. I mean, and you got to stop waiting for something, you know, some force, some circumstance, some job, some person to come along and rescue you. When you face the Rockies, there is a choice you'll have to make. And the truth is, you make that choice all the time, every day, practically. And it's a choice between hope and despair. It's a choice between life and death, between trusting that with God, all things really are possible and just giving in to defeat and despair. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you can't control. This, again, is one of those areas in which Christian hope is quite different from just a general positive attitude. You know, you were handed some genetic material, and you had no choice about that. You grew up in a family of origin, for better or for worse, and you didn't have a choice about that. You were plopped into a certain environment. You didn't have much choice about that. But the Bible says that way deep down, deeper than your genes and deeper than your environment and deeper than your family, you were made in the image of God. And partly what that involves is the fact that somewhere, way deep down inside of you, you can choose. You are a moral agent. You're a spiritual being. And you are an immortal person created in the image of God. And you can choose hope or despair. And there's a little something of eternity Every time you make that choice and you mark that part of your life that we talk about as character, that the Bible speaks of as your spirit, and every time you choose despair, I mean, every time you allow the Rockies to defeat you and cause you to quit, you make it that much more likely that next time it'll take a smaller mountain to defeat you and the next time a smaller one still until one day you don't even launch into the journey. There is such a thing as a resilient hope. And there is such a thing as a resilient faith and a good God. And this faith is open to you. It is available to you. This God has made himself available to you. And I don't know what challenges you face. And I don't know what obstacles and burdens have been laid on your shoulders. But I do know that you are a child created in the image of God and that his hope and help, it's available to you. But you got to own it. And God can help you but you got to own it and you're not alone. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you'd overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, why should we even have this amount of hope, this bedrock hope? Why does Paul call God the God of hope? Well, it's simple, really. Because of Jesus. Because Jesus came back from the dead. He rose from the grave. He defeated the ultimate challenge, the ultimate fear, the ultimate problem, which was sin and death. Because he was filled with an unshakable confidence in his father. And he was so very clear on his identity, who he was and what God had called him to do. Jesus laid down his perfect life. He died on a cross. He was buried in a tomb and he was raised to new life. That's why. You see, if Jesus hadn't been raised again, 
well, this would all just be a bunch of hollow positivity, you know, be a nice story, be a metaphorical inspiration, but not a bedrock hope. For 2,000 years, this has been the cornerstone of hope, a risen Lord. That's Christian hope. I want to encourage you to, to pray this prayer that Paul prays in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so you to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, make it your verse this week. Memorize it. Go back to it each day. And anytime you're stressed or anxious or worried or despairing, you pull out Romans 15, 13, and you reorient your life and heart to the God of hope. I want us to pray together now, and I'd like for you to take just a moment and consider where it is in your life that you're most vulnerable to losing hope. I mean, where is it that the winds are kind of blowing in the wrong direction right now, and you're most tempted to give up? Would you just take a moment to talk to God about that and tell Him where it is that you need hope? Tell Him that you really do want to cling to Him and ask for His wisdom, ask Him for His help. Let's pray together. Father God, would you give us all a firm confidence in just how capable you really are? And would you remind us of your goodness, assure us of your love for us, how precious and treasured and noticed and cared for we are in your eyes. Give us, Father, an unshakable poise as we navigate this life, that you are right there partnering with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.